Here are five tricks that you can use to build a strong community that buys from you. My community building journey started back in 2017 when I was scaling Worldwide Engineering. At its peak, we had a moment where the brand was going viral and we were gaining not one, not two, but 3,000 followers every single day. I thought I had unlocked the secret to growing on Instagram. So I had an idea. I decided to do something. I thought I could continue growing worldwide engineering. And at the same time, I could go out and acquire other pages, other companies that look like mine in the same niche that I was operating in and scale these along the same wavelength using the same strategies. And I proceeded with that idea and ended up messaging a couple different pages that were in the same industry as mine. Found someone that was interested in furthering the conversation. We agreed on what I thought was a good deal uh, for the acquisition. And a couple weeks went by, the bank transfer was received, the contact information, the information for the page login were transferred, and I was officially in. I thought I had unlocked infinite growth when it came to my community. Out of excitement, I logged into that new page that I had just acquired and started publishing the content framework that I was following for Worldwide Engineering. And I very quickly realized that there was something off with that new brand that I had bought. I realized that the quality of the engagement was not the same. The reaction from the community whenever I was posting content were not to the same depth and to the same quality that they were with Worldwide Engineering. I go to the DM section of the page and I realized that the fan messages that that page was receiving were nothing close what I had with Worldwide Engineering. You see, back then with Worldwide Engineering, I had a pretty strong community of people that were following the brand. People were buying into the merchandise that I was putting out and were taking them to their workspace. Some people were sticking, sent me pictures of them sticking the logo, the sticker that I would send to people. I would get people posting that on their social media. The community of Worldwide Engineering was alive, but the community for the new brand that I had purchased was not. There was a clear difference. And that became the first time that I started looking a little bit deeper into the phenomenon. Why was it that Worldwide Engineering had a stronger community of people versus that new brand that I had acquired? And this experience right here, this failed acquisition, if you want to call it that way, made me realize that I was unintentionally doing certain things with Worldwide Engineering that allowed me to cultivate and grow a strong community that was loyal to the brand and bought into the ethos of what was it that I was building. And in today's video, I'm going to be showing you the five ingredients that make up a healthy community and how can you as a Web3 founder or a Web3 marketer use these ingredients within your community to make people more loyal to your brand and make them buy more. I'm going to be diving into examples from large Web2 companies, how they've used these ingredients, how Web3 companies have used them, and of course, how I was doing it with Worldwide Engineering that allowed me to get that more loyal fan base with the brand. And if this is the first time we meet, my name is Leon Aboud, and I've worked with over a hundred of the top Web3 brands, build communities and sell their products in the Web3 space. And I make these videos today because I'm honestly sick and tired of seeing questionable founders with questionable business, with questionable intentions in the NFT and Web3 space, launch products and succeed better than some of the people right here that are actually caring about this industry and building products and services that have the potential to revolutionize the industry. So my goal with these videos is to share with you all the secrets and knowledge that I'm learning through my experience working with the top brands so you can apply them into your business and succeed to the best of your ability. So what really makes a strong community? The first step of building a strong community is to give it a name. Think about some of the strongest communities out there, whether it's Rihanna, whether it's Taylor Swift or Justin Bieber. Every single one of these communities have a name that is distinct, that creates a sense of identity within the community. Beyonce, we have the Beehives, Taylor Swift, Swifties, 
Justin Bieber, we have the believers. And the secret with giving your community a name is that it has to fit after the words I am. The same phenomenon applies with some of the top brands that we've seen built in Web3. I am a pudgy penguin. I am an Azuki. I am a bored ape holder. And although this sounds intuitive, I see a lot of Web3 founders overlook this step and end up creating names for their communities that do not create a strong sense of identity. I remember myself back in the tail end of the bull market, I invested in this community called Origins NFT. It was an alpha group for builders and it was a pretty expensive investment. I think it was four or five Ethereum when I had invested into it back in the days. The name of the project, the name of the community was called Origins and it was crafted and the NFT itself was a pass as you can see right here. The community was strong. The utility that came from it was good. However, what was missing was a sense of identity because as you can imagine, the name origin, the name of the community is a lot harder to use as an identity. And the actual art that comes with the community is one that makes it a lot harder to create a sense of identity around. The pudgy penguins, the azukis, and the bored ape, the profile picture meta that comes with NFTs allow you to create strong identity. It allows you to couple the words I am with the picture, with the aesthetic, with the ethos, and with the values that come with the community. And as you might know, a pass does not hit the same thing. So for you as a Web3 founder, if building a sense of identity and a culture behind your project, you can all of a sudden understand how going with a profile picture that speaks and symbolizes the values of your community fits a lot more than having some generic pass or passport or card, however you want to call it. So that's the first thing that makes up a strong community. A strong community needs a name. The second element that makes up a strong community is proof of belonging. Just like with Ethereum, we have proof of stake or proof of work, how it used to be back in the days. With community, you need what is called proof of belonging. When I was younger, a lot of my friends, just like a lot of you watching this, did not consider me the popular guy in high school. I was very often when you would split the classroom into two and all of a sudden have people pick teams for their sport activity, whether it was football or soccer, however you want to call it. I was one of those people that would end up being picked last because there were a couple people left that were available. And I ended up being thrown as a goalkeeper because especially in amateur soccer, as a goalkeeper, your goal is very simple. Just stand there and try to take as much space. That was the only responsibility that was with that. The reason I share this story is out of the people here today, how many of you have felt the same way where you end up being picked into a team, but you never really belong. You never really felt that you were picked for who you are or for your contribution, but you were just picked because you just happened to be there and you just happened to be able to be selected. That's how a lot of us feel. And a good community is one that has the ability to make you feel a sense of belonging. In it. it was the exact reason why a couple of years later, I found music and I found a new home where all of a sudden, as a bassist, my contribution to the community was a lot more narrowed. It was very clear what my roles and responsibilities were. And I all of a sudden found a family that I was able to contribute to and see my contribution being appreciated. And my experience with music was actually the place where I ended up meeting my business partner today, Crypto Kermit. We were playing music back in the days together. He was lead guitarist, I was the bassist. So you can see how all of a sudden, with the right community, you have the ability to create lifelong friendships and lifelong connections that are gonna stick with you and are gonna evolve as you evolve as a human being because we both felt like we belonged there. So you're watching this and you might be asking yourself, how do I create a sense of belonging within my community? And the easiest answer to that complex question is co-creation. And this is a story that I heard from Pat Finn, a very famous entrepreneur who shared the story of Lego. Back in 2003, Lego was $800 million in debt. But by 2015, they generated $1 billion in sales. How did they do this? When they transitioned CEO, one of the first things that the CEO did is he observed 
that there was actually a strong community, an underground community being built around Lego pieces. And back in the days, Lego was a type of company that were pretty much a plastic manufacturer. They would be pumping out and they were just out there printing and creating new models. What the new CEO did is he started listening to the community all the way to creating something today called Ideas by Lego, where all of a sudden, as a Lego community member, you have the ability to contribute and to become part of the co-creation process of Lego. You literally have the ability to submit ideas of Lego pieces and Lego models. And if your ideas were to get a certain level of upvote and a certain level of support from the community, it would be pushed into priority to become an actual produced manufacturing model. And that is how Lego was able to utilize an asset, a community that was very much underground. They were able to take that and all of a sudden use that community to create a greater sense of engagement and equip them with the tools that would allow the community to grow, but to also allow the community to grow in strength. What Lego Ideas allowed to do is not only allowed people to contribute with their ideas, but it allowed other contributors to support each other. The people who would actually support a Lego model would oftentimes be the very first people who would go and buy that specific model of the stores and of the website when it was for sale. And this right here is the exact same strategy that very popular NFT project Pixelmon used when growing their community. During a podcast interview that I had with Julio, the founder and CEO of Liquids X Studios, which is the mother company that owns Pixelmon, he mentioned something that really blew my mind. He said, one of the things that they did to grow community engagement is they have specific Discord communities that are NDA gated. The only way for you to enter these communities is you need to sign an NDA. And in these specific channels, the people part of these channels would get first access to game trailers, to game mockups, to character designs, and to storylines. And what this allowed to do is to create greater engagement within the super fans within the community, but also get instant market feedback on, is this even a good idea? Is this even a good a path forward for the project? Instead of them shipping a product and all of a sudden realizing that, oh, damn, damn, the community didn't resonate well with this. Building alongside the community allowed them to get the support from the community, but also iterate on the product from the people that actually care about the product before it was even shipped, finalized, and tens of thousands of dollars were spent on that specific angle of the product. When it comes to worldwide engineering, one of the things that I was doing by intuition was whenever I was posting, all the content that was being published is very much educational slash entertainment, so edutainment. What the signature move for worldwide engineering was in, a, in an industry where most people would just throw a piece of content and just no caption at all. It was just like the caption was oftentimes follow brand account. Where I came in, and created something new, unique, and different. The captions behind the posts were very rich in educational content. Sometimes I would have pages, lines, paragraphs of explanation behind what was happening. What I was able to do by doing that, by having big captions, is curate a community of people that were actually readers, that were actually curious individuals. And I was then able to cultivate a deep conversation through the questions that I would ask. And what I started seeing through that that I didn't see in the other community that I had acquired was I would often see the very same people who were oftentimes in opposing views, oftentimes on topics, just have conversations with one another. On multiple posts, I would see the very same people having back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I created a culture of debate. I created a culture of deep conversations. And that is how with Worldwide Engineering, I was able to cultivate a strong sense of community. And talking about the first pillar, which I forgot to mention with giving your community a name. With Worldwide Engineering, the name of the community was as simple as, hey, Worldwide Engineers. I was talking with the community. I was addressing them as Worldwide Engineers. And it was not a very fancy name. It was, if I were to do this again with my current marketing know-how, I would probably go with a different community name. However, all that to say, sometimes just having a community name versus not having one makes it more sticky and makes it more personal for the community. So, so far we've seen the two things that make up a strong community are give your community name and number two, create a sense of belonging through co-creation. 
The third ingredient of a strong community are the sacred words. And the sacred words are a concept that I learned from the book Primal Branding that talks about the different things that make up a cult-like following. And the book is by Patrick Hanlon and says that sacred words are part of a brand's lexicon that helps create a sense of community and identity among its followers. For example, within the gym community, we have a very specific lexicon that we all understand and have agreed upon. Everyone understands when they are asked, how many sets do you have left? How many reps are you doing? What is your PR? I'm doing leg day. Could you spot me? And then the, the fingering, when, when you're looking at someone at the gym and you finger towards a machine, you're asking without using words, are you done or are you using this? And then people either nod yes or no. That is an agreed upon lexicon that we use within the community. It is native to the community. And if you were to use these terms to someone that is not native to the community, all of a sudden, it would not resonate with them. Within Web3, Oh man, we got a lot of sacred words that we use. Only in Web3 do you understand what HODL means, what NGMI, what buy the dip, what sweep mean, gas, what does gas mean? Only someone in Web3 mean in the context of anything other than the petrol station. What is proof of work? What is proof of stake? What is a TGE, which is a token generation event? What is a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization? What is bullish and bearish? What do those words mean? NFT, smart contract, liquidity pool, mint, rug, farming, LFG, airdrop, WAGMI. These are all terms that we use very regularly within Web3. It's a language and it's a lexicon that is native to us as a larger and a broader community. And that is one of the reasons why I've tried to hire Web2 people, bring them into Web3. The hardest part about Web3 is to get people acclimated to the culture, to the words. I remember we had we were hiring a copywriter and I made the decision internally of hiring in Web2 because I thought all the good talent was in Web2, not in Web3. So we hired in Web2 and it ended up being a catastrophe. I had recorded a full 25 minute video taking people through every single word that they might encounter. It was literally a training course that we had created to take someone that is Web2 native into Web3 native and as quickly as possible of a journey. It did not work. Two weeks after that person that we had hired turned, they did not resonate with the industry. They could not see themselves working within that industry because they did not resonate with the culture. So we have industry specific sacred words, but we also have community specific sacred words. For example, within the Neo Tokyo community, one thing that they always use is grand rising. It's a very native term that they use within. And whenever you see someone do this, you know that they are part of the Neo Tokyo community. For Izuki, when I joined the Izuki community, I remember I had joined the Discord and I announced that, hey guys, I finally made it into the community. And I remember people were responding to me with IKZ, this combination of three words. And I didn't understand. I didn't make much of it back then. I didn't understand what it meant. Only a couple of weeks after to learn from someone that IKZ was short for Aikuzo, which meant... LFG, let's go, in Japanese. So this right here is a native term that Azuki holders use. For example, for the Chimpers community, which is a project that we had the chance to work with, we have a very good case study with them. Lexic, one lexicon that they have is question mark chimp. And anytime you post anything about Chimpers or you join the Discord or you say something positive about the community, you're going to see your comment sections are going to be just chimp, 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 chimp. These are the sacred words that they use. For sappy seals, they use ARF. For Mog, they have these two emojis, the laughing cat with the pointing finger. Pudgy Monday is for pudgy penguins. Ape In was started by board ape holders. And I can keep going, but you get the idea. And the goal with community-specific sacred words is oftentimes these are organically created by the community. They are not created top-down and injected by the leadership team into the community. They're often created organically within the community. There is the leaders behind the project that take that and they all of a sudden push it to the masses and make it a term that is, they democratize access to that term in a way. They make it, all right, this is how we speak within the community. One example from Web2 of community created initiatives that were supported by the main company was going back to Lego. The community started doing is they would start creating meetups, local meetups within major cities. And these meetups slowly started to grow. 
all of a sudden becoming conference-sized events. And what did Lego do? They didn't go out and all of a sudden try shutting down the events because of copyright strikes. No, they actually supported these events. They went on to create resources to help these event planners. They went on to support these events monetarily, sponsoring some of them. So this is an example of an organically created community incentive that was then supported by the mother brand. Number four ingredient of a successful community is the guide. And I use the term the guide from the incredible book that I would recommend every community builder to read, which is called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And the guide is the figure or entity that embodies the brand's values and guides the hero, which is the customer, through their journey. And if I am to give you a quick sum up of what does the story brand look like, it starts with a character that has a problem and then meets a guide who gives them a plan and calls them to action that either ends in success or helps them avoid failure. And if you are to think of all your favorite movies, your superhero movies, your favorite Hollywood movies, they all follow the exact same structure, a character that has a problem and meets a guide. And talking about the story brand, one thing Donald Miller mentions is a common issue and a common shortcoming that people who try to roll out the story brand fall into is they position themselves as the main character. I'm sure you've seen this somewhere. I'm sure you've seen brands that says, we are the future of Web3. We are revolutionizing the way e-commerce is working. We are the number one fastest chain on the blockchain. We're building the future of sustainable energy. These are all statements that position you as a brand as the main character. A story brand that connects with your target audience and makes your brand stick out in people's mind is one where you position the customer as the hero of the journey and where you position yourself as the guy that is going to help these customers bring their goals, aspirations into life. Every brand that has a strong movement behind it, whether it's Steve Jobs, whether it's Tony Robbins, or whether it's Alex Hermosi with acquisition.com, let me put that on. These characters always position themselves as the guide to support the customer through their journey. And the goal of the guide is to reinforce the brand's positioning as a trusted ally in the customer's story. And the keyword here is trusted. People follow people. People resonate with people. That is why it is a lot harder, not impossible, but a lot harder to build a brand that is void of a figure. People have done it, but it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. Think about your favorite company. Think about your favorite NFT project, whether it's Pudgy Penguins with... Luca Nets, they all buy into these communities because of a figure that acts as the guiding voice of trust and the reinforces the brand's ethos and positioning. And talking about the hero and the guide, I actually have a cautionary tale for you. And this one is with Yeezy Sounds. This was actually a story that was mentioned by Donald Miller in his book. And with Yeezy Sounds, what Kanye West was trying to do is to create a new music streaming platform to compete with Spotify and Apple Music. However, the brand, the app, positioned itself as a tool that would support artists to create better music, that would support artists with new tools, technology, and that would support artists in their expression of their art, which is music. Where they misaligned the positioning of the hero is that they positioned the artist as the hero and not the consumer. This was an app designed to get people interested in the actual product. The customer, the people who would pay for the product were the customers, were not the artists. And this is where there was a misalignment with the hero, where they positioned the app as a tool for artists. Well, in reality, it should have been positioned as a tool for the listeners, a new experience that could help listeners connect deeper with their favorite artists, find new music, and a more streamlined music experience that is more community-driven. And Yeezy Sounds is a great example where the character, the hero positioning, was that aligned with the story brand. When it comes to worldwide engineering, one of the things that I was doing, simply because I, I just enjoyed doing it, is... In an industry where most brands were ran by 
anonymous founders. There was no face behind the brand. I was out there sharing very regularly my journey as an engineering student. When I was growing worldwide engineering, I was still an engineering student. And what I would often do is I would pull out my camera and just do an Instagram story sharing about something that just happened to me in school and university, something I just learned, something I thought that was cool, something that I was working on. I was showing the behind the scenes of us packing the agendas that we would ship to people. And what this allowed to do is it allowed to personalize and personificate the figure behind the brand and allowed it to make it a lot more personal to people. And that is how with Worldwide Engineering, literally, if there was one of the reasons why people were a lot, had a stronger sense of community behind the community, it was because I was just simply showing my face and I was out there showing people the behind the scenes of the typical life of an engineering student. So oftentimes, just having a leading figure, just having a voice, just having a face behind the brand, you don't need to be the most charismatic. I definitely wasn't. You don't need to be the best speaker or you don't need to have medals of achievements behind your back to all of a sudden be relevant enough to be the face of a brand. You don't need all those things. You just need to be human and you just need to take people through the behind the scenes that it takes to build your brand. Now, the final ingredient that makes up a strong community is the villain. And this, again, is a concept that is very importantly defined within the story brand. The villain represents an external force or problem that a customer faces. And the villain, one of the important metrics about the villain is it needs to be concrete, quick to understand, and easy to imagine. For example, a villain cannot be a metaphorical figure. For example, evil is our villain, or the world's injustice is our villain. No, the villain needs to be easily understood by the community, and it needs to be clear how can the villain be defeated. When it comes to Apple, the villain was complex and outdated technology. Dollar Shave Club for every other bearded men out there. It was expensive and low quality razors. For Slack, it is workspace communication chaos. And for Brave, for example, Brave Browser, one of the projects, the Web3 clients that we personally work with, for them, the villain is very clearly defined. The corporate greedy enterprises that are siphoning and monetizing the data of the users. So all of a sudden, you know, with this villain very well defined, if you are someone that cares about their privacy and doesn't like a greedy corporate stealing your data, monetizing that, you all of a sudden are going to find community and are going to find a resonance and values and ethos with Brave. Now, in creating your villain for your specific community, this right here is the five-step process that I would follow. Number one, I would identify the core problem that my community is facing. What is something that is stopping them from achieving their goal? I would then personify it. There is a villain out there. You would give it a name and you would make it easy to understand. The third thing that you would do is you would highlight the impact that this villain has had on the lives of your customers, the slowdown and the growth of your customer, the impact that this has had on their journey. You would highlight these and then you would inject your solution as the guiding solution of your customer's journey. And then what you would do finally is that you would use that to steer emotion and engage your community around your brand. Think about it. Every strong movement has polarity. In religion, you have the believers and the non-believers. In politics, you have the Democrats and the Republicans. You have the Apple users versus the non-Apple users, the Starbucks drinkers and the non-Starbucks drinkers, Adidas versus Nike, Ethereum versus Solana. Ethereum people have a strong belief that Ethereum is the best thing that has happened. And Solana, look at Ethereum and laugh at the expensive gas prices that they have. Everything in life needs polarity. And the worst thing you can do is to be at the center and try to appease for everyone. Because all of a sudden, you're going to appease to no one. When you try to speak to everyone, you are speaking to no one. And this is where, as a brand, as a guide, you need to take a strong position in helping your community defeat the villain. A couple ideas that I have for Web3 builders that are trying to create a villain, and this right here fits in the personifying the villain, is the banking behemoth. Let's say you're trying to revolutionize the future of finance and a story that you know resonates with me as someone who grew up in Lebanon and then moved to Canada, is uh, the transferring money to my parents. 
is incredibly complex. Now, when I want to transfer money to my parents, I do it via crypto. I actually do. Crypto has literally allowed me to overcome the banking behemoth. Then we have the gas guzzler. Let's say you're building a chain that is more efficient than anything the world has ever seen. You could throw rocks at all these other chains that are just guzzling gas and making the price of your electricity go up. The gas guzzler. The data devil. Great example of brave. Corporate siphoning data out. You can name them the data devil. Then you have the centralized overlord whether it's the centralized data, whether it's centralized information, centralized banking, centralized monopolies, whatever it is you're going after, the centralized overlord is a way to personify your actual villain. And finally, the art gatekeeper. This is one that is very relevant to people who are building in RWAs, real world assets, and are fractionalizing art pieces. One thing RWAs do is they democratize access to Assets that otherwise would only be available to a certain subsegment of society, whether it's the high income, people with licenses, people that fit a certain category of society, people that fit within a certain demographic of finances, people that fit within a certain tax bracket. The art gatekeeper is a great example of if you are going after the art space and trying to democratize that, that is a perfect villain that you can use. And the community is instantly going to understand who is it you're trying to beat and they're going to join you on that vision on that mission what i'm going to be doing right now is i'm actually going to be showing you an incredible trailer that i recently fell on that does an incredible job in one minute at hitting at all these elements identifying the core problem personifying it highlighting the impact injecting your solution and then searing emotion and engaging the community in only one minute you're going to see a story an advertisement of how this company was able to hit on all of these and inject themselves as the guide and as the solution. Amazing example. This is the pinnacle of what marketing looks like. Let's watch it. What is it? It's some kind of message. I don't get it. Who demands such a thing? It's the client. My vendors need a wake-up call, and I'm the one that's going to give it to them. You also get on a call. Sure, this afternoon works. He wants to meet now. I've got changes. But you approved everything last week. Oops. The client is ruining efficiency and profitability everywhere. The client says we never sent him the password to the file. He's literally responding to the email that I gave it to him in. Bolded and highlighted. Why does account management cost this much? Uh, that's just... I want a full breakdown of what everyone is doing. Uh, but... What's the issue? I'm sure you're tracking your time. <laughs> You say good, fast, cheap, pick two? Well, I want all three. How do we resource this? How do we make money? How do we stop the client? He doesn't need to be stopped. He needs to be managed. Who said that? It's not who I am. It's the tools I use. Who are you? <coughs> I'm Dave from Teamwork.com, the only platform that helps you manage your client work profitably. It makes clients, like the client, less clienty. Here, use it. How good was this all of a sudden? Don't you feel a closer sense of proximity because all of a sudden, as a business owner myself, I see myself in the story that was given. And I see how the brand positioned themselves as the guy that is going to help me overcome some of these challenges that I'm facing. This is what a strong story does. It helps make your customers more familiar and closer to your brand. So ladies and gentlemen, these were the five elements that make up a strong community. Give your community a name. Create proof of belonging through co-creation. Create sacred words. Number four, have a guide that leads the community to Valhalla. And number five, have a villain that is standing in the way of the community. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leon Aboud, and it was a great pleasure sharing this time together. I shall see you in the very next video.
Cheers.